Hey nerds, do you like strange, random, weird, and fascinating history? Do you want to be the person full of useless info at the next party? Then go check out Strange History Podcast available on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Audible, iHeartRadio, and Spreaker, and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Listen, and of course, subscribe. You can learn all about the crazy origin story of the Lego company. That's right. Legos have a dark history full of suicide, arson, and theft, or how the most successful pirate was actually a woman and a prostitute, and this happened in the 1800s, no less. There is that and more. Check it out now. The Strange History Podcast and I, your host, Amy Domestica, would be honored to have you as a listener. Okay, nerds, back to your current podcast. But don't forget, the Strange History Podcast, subscribe and listen. Peace out. Stories and content in weird darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This is a Fireside Frights episode where I put away all of the music, the sound effects, and fancy production. It's just you, me, this campfire, and whatever sounds nature wants to give us in the background. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bulge your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. We'll begin our fireside frights with a story from Samantha. So the story, uh, she titles it, Who is Upstairs? To set up the story, you need to know a few things, she says. I don't personally believe in spirits, per se, but I am open-minded and believe there is something strange in the world. My father doesn't believe in spirits at all. He is a very logical man. That being said, if you presented him with solid evidence, he would not dismiss it. Even without the belief, my dad is careful. He won't mess with Ouija boards or any of that stuff, and when he was buying our house, he straight up asked the realtor if the place was haunted or if anyone had died in it. Well, Samantha, it sounds like your dad kind of is a believer <laughs> if he's asking those kind of questions. Okay, anyway. To answer, the answer to both of those questions was no, and we've lived here now for over 15 years. We'd moved in when I was fairly young. I had two weird things happen to me, years apart. I don't know if they're paranormal, but they were certainly unusual. The first happened when I was probably about 13 or 14. Our house is a bungalow with stairs right inside the door that lead down to the basement. It's kind of our rec room with our TV and game consoles. We've always had great sound systems. We love things with heavy bass or really cool sounds. So one weekend, I decided to stay home while my parents and older brother went to town. It's a chance to blast some awesome music. Now, since it's the summer, most of the windows are opened. The patio door is open and the door is open, leaving the screen door closed. As many people do, we use the door on the side of the house, not the very front. That one stays closed and locked most of the time. But I live in a fairly safe place. You don't really have to worry about leaving your door unlocked, so here I am listening to my music way too loud when suddenly I hear the door slam shut. I pause the music and listen. I'm confused. I know I heard it. When that door is slammed shut, it makes a very distinct sound. It was definitely my door, and it was too loud to be the neighbor's door. Maybe my family's home but I don't know why they would close the inside door. I listen for another moment and don't hear them. I figure maybe the door slammed shut on its own. There was some wind and perhaps the open windows caused a cross breeze. Oddly enough, I didn't even think about it being an intruder at first. Instead of leaving it at that, I decided to look up the stairs. I stop at the bottom and look up. The door is wide open. I just stare at it. I know I heard it slam, and with that sound, it would have shut for sure and been unable to reopen on its own. I slowly ascended the stairs, weary. 
I look all around the house, not a single person but me. I'm on edge now, so to make myself feel better I close and lock the door, both the deadbolt and the lock on the handle. Though I don't close anything else, I feel more at ease. I go back downstairs and resume my music. Not five minutes later I jump at the sound of the door slamming again. I sit there, heart racing, there's no way! I run to the stairs, the door is shut. I go and check it, but it is still locked. It was definitely that door. The sound was too loud to be anything else. I go back downstairs, but don't restart my music. Eventually I relax enough to continue watching stuff and I don't hear the door again. Fast forward to now, nearly ten years later. Yes, my brother and I still both live at home, no judgments. Housing is super expensive right now where I live, and my family has always been close, so we were never pressured to move out. We help with chores and bills and groceries, so our parents don't mind. This only happened a few weeks ago. It was another weekend, I was downstairs, again, half asleep on the couch. My brother is upstairs in his room, and my parents are out running errands. I get a text from my dad about supper. I reply and start to doze again. A few minutes later I hear movement upstairs in the kitchen, which is what you have to go through to get to the bedrooms from the door. I hear the door open and shut. I assume it's my brother. My dad probably messaged him to come give them a hand with taking things in. I'm a little confused because the text my dad had sent before made it sound like they hadn't gotten supper yet, so I didn't expect them home yet, but still I grab my phone waiting for him to send me a text as well asking for a hand nothing. I hear the door again. This time I hear talking. Now, I'm still sleepy, but I recognize what I believe is my mom talking to my brother. They talk for a while, more movement, then the door again, and quiet. My next line of thinking is, okay, mom was tired or not feeling the best and got dad to take her home, and now he and my brother are going back for food. It's happened before. Then I remembered the text my dad had sent me saying my brother was getting food at the same place I was and was it okay to use my card because it was already in the restaurant's app. I'd replied a quick yes and put my phone down, but I looked back again and I was right. They should not be home yet. So I text him, are you home? He replies with, no, why? I think for a minute before asking, are you really or are you home and just saying that? We like to joke around, so maybe he's pretending that he's not and will walk in the door a moment later. He says no again and tells me where he is, which would have been at least 20 minutes from our house or more depending on traffic. So I go upstairs. Nothing looks odd. The door is closed. Then my brother happens to come to the kitchen for some water. I ask him, were you out here a little while ago? He replies with, yes. So I ask him if he went outside or was talking with anybody or talking to himself. He said he didn't go outside or even open the door, and he was humming to himself but wasn't talking. I tell him what I heard, and he's confused too since Mom obviously wasn't here and he has not seen anyone. He doesn't even sound like her, and I would not mistake the two, even half asleep. I'm, I am very unsettled now. When they do get home, I tell my dad, knowing he won't believe it's paranormal, and I'm not sure I do either, but knowing something was weird and I couldn't explain it. My mom had not come home early, she was with my dad the whole time, and they didn't call my brother or anything, so why did I hear her voice? And who was coming in and out of the house? If what I heard was real, someone would have still been inside and my brother certainly would have seen them if someone had randomly walked in. It could have been a sort of dream from being half asleep, but after the first time I heard the door I had woken myself up because I thought I would have to go upstairs. To this day, I don't know how to explain either of those instances, and maybe I never will. Well, uh, that that's, a, that's a great, great uh, entry there, Samantha. That is some creepy stuff. Interesting that it happened to you 10 years apart, though. I would think if you had a haunted house, you'd see stuff like this more often. 
you know, that first time and then maybe, you know, a few weeks later, a few months later, but a whole 10 years before this entity or whatever it is decides to show its head again? That's what's that's, that's kind of strange. I will say that uh that's, I, I don't know if you heard that, it's my phone going off. That's okay, I'll catch that later. Um I will say this is a perfect reason to have a home security system because at least if you have a security system, you know there goes there it goes again. Um at least if you have a security system, you know that somebody's walked into the house because that door would open and it would trigger the security system. Unless you've got a smart ghost that knows the code to, to your security system. I don't know, but that is uh, that is some freaky stuff there, Samantha. I, I bring up the security system because today, March 17th, 2023, is the first day for a new sponsor for us. It's ADT. And uh, they're actually giving away free uh, home security systems. Uh, all you have to do is go to Weird Darkness slash, uh, excuse me, weirddarkness.com slash ADT, and you can learn more about that. I'm not going to push it uh, right here right now. I just wanted to mention it because they're a new sponsor, and I'm pretty excited about it. So that's weirddarkness.com slash ADT. Thank you for the story, Samantha. That was, uh, that was really good. Our next story comes from Jeff. He says, hey there, Darren. I want to tell you a true ghost story from my childhood. It's pretty cool. My parents divorced when I was still a baby, and he lived out of state. Thus, I grew up not knowing my father or having a father figure at all. When I was about 11 years old, I cried to God one night to please, please bring my father into my life. I cried about my father like I never had before. To my utter surprise and amazement, two weeks later, I came home on a Sunday after spending the weekend at my great aunt and uncle's and was told by my mother that my father had moved back to Michigan and was living in his hometown. This was only a few towns away from where we lived. My mother told me that my father wanted to talk to me and to see me. She said it was my choice, that after never writing, not ever sending a birthday or Christmas card, she'd understand if I did not want to talk to him or see him. But I did. And so I called. He wanted to take me snowmobiling with my two half-brothers, both of whom were several years younger than me. I had met my father, his second wife, and my two half-brothers once over a weekend with his parents when I was eight. I was excited to go snowmobiling with my father and two brothers. My great-grandparents on his side had both died a few years ago at that time. They lived on a large farm in Alma, Michigan. I was not especially close to them, but I did spend a fair amount of time there when I would go to stay at my father's parents' house. When my great-grandparents passed, my uncle took possession of the house and it said that we could use the snowmobiles that were in the barn there. The day was cold, but we had a lot of fun racing across huge, bare farm fields. My father and I each drove a snowmobile, and my two younger brothers took turns on who, rode that, on who they rode with, as they were too young to drive a snowmobile by themselves. I was literally days away from turning 12 and had grown up riding small dirt bikes and three- and four-wheelers. When we returned to the farm at dusk, we ended up deciding to explore the barn. I'm not sure whose idea it was. As we explored, we began to feel uneasy and a bit unnerved. We found rooms that were walled off, both upstairs and in the ground floor. We could see furniture and items strewn about these rooms by shining lights in through cracks in the walls. We couldn't understand why they would leave things in the rooms, yet board them up. We could only suppose that the rooms had been boarded up because the floors above them had become unstable and unsafe, and therefore they walled off both the upper and lower floors in that area to keep people safe. But this did not explain why they did then not clear the rooms out before walling them off. At any rate, night had fallen by the time we left. A large, bright, full moon shined brightly in the sky. It made the snow and ice shine and sparkle. Above us, on a hill that overlooked the farm, all the lights in the house were on, and my dad explained that my uncle had put timers on the lights so as to deter people from breaking in or snooping around the farm. We got into my father's car and left to head back to town, which was about a 15-20 to 20 minute drive. When we got back to town, my father took us to McDonald's where we went through the drive through My father ordered our food, and we'd made it a little past the pay window, and my father exclaimed, CRAP! We remembered to lock up the barn, but we left all the lights on! We're going to have to drive back out there. And so, after we got our food, we headed back out to the distant old farm. 
Once we arrived at the farm, and my father was driving down the hill to the big barn, he said, "'Okay, Travis and Ryan, you two stay in the car. Jeff and I are going to run in and turn out the lights.'" What my young mind comprehended at that moment was that my father, big and loud-mouthed as he was, was also still a bit creeped out and didn't want to go into the barn by himself. A design flaw with the old barn was that where the main entrance was was also a large room away from the row of light switches. And so my father and I crossed the room and my father lit his lighter before he flipped the lights off. This did little to illuminate the room, but the bright moon outside clearly marked the doorway we had to reach. When we exited the barn, I walked towards the car as my father turned to lock the deadbolt on the door. I was surprised to see both my brothers standing outside the car in the cold night air, staring up towards the house on the hill. I almost reached the car when my dad asked my brothers from behind me, "'Why the heck are you standing out in the cold? Get back in the car!' As a response to my father, instead of getting in the car, one of my brothers pointed up at the house and asked, "'Dad, who is that?' I looked up towards the house at the same time my father did. I was shocked and dumbfounded because there, near the large tree my great-grandfather used to love sitting by, stood a man who had been dead for four or five years by this time. I turned to look at my father, who had also turned to look at me with huge eyes and asked in a low, unsteady voice, "'Is that who I think it is?' And my father said to me, "'That's Grandpa.'" We stared at each other for a few seconds and then looked back up towards the hill and the spot where we had seen my great-grandfather standing, but no one was there. My father asked, where did he go? My two younger brothers both said they didn't know. My father, it seemed, was not going to or did not want to accept the clearly paranormal event that had just taken place. He stated that we needed to go up to the house and make sure no one was snooping around or trying to take anything. We walked up the driveway a ways and then cut into the deeper snow. To our astonishment and amazement, there were no footprints anywhere on the hill where we had seen the man standing. My father, still in disbelief, went to the house and began knocking on the door. When that brought no one, he instructed my brothers and I to go with him around the house and to look in all the windows and see if we could see anybody inside. But we saw no one and all the snow around the house was pristine and and, uh, untrampled or walked on. The only tracks in the snow that night were our own. After we'd gone around the entire house and checking to see if any windows would open or could see anyone inside, my father was still determined that we had without a doubt seen a man standing on the hill looking down on us and that he could just not disappear. And So, ignoring our statements to my father about there being no footprints in the snow, and we were now freaked the heck out, my father told us to stay there on the hill he was going to go check the cellar. Flicking his trusty lighter, my father went down into the basement slash cellar below that ancient farmhouse and returned after a few minutes. He found no one and no evidence that anyone had been down there. My father was then determined to get off that farm post-haste, and he raced precariously on these slippery country roads. I thought for sure we were going to get into a ditch, but we didn't, and I got home safely. About a year and a half after that, I stopped talking to my father and began avoiding going to even stay at his parents' house, so I didn't have the chance meeting him. I was hanging out with him, though, when I was 18, and we were smoking a bit of weed, and I asked my dad, do you remember that night we went snowmobiling years ago and we saw Grandpa's ghost? My father looked over at me, and his eyes were big like they had been that night, and he told me he'd never been able to forget that night. One thing my father said really unnerved him was that neither of my brothers had ever met my great-grandparents, so it's not like we could all psych ourselves up and expect to see him and share, like, a group vision or something. Nor was it the sharing of a collective memory. My father said he could find no way to explain it other than it being my grandfather's ghost. My father passed away back in 2010, but my brothers are still alive, and I'd like to ask them if they remember that day. I'm 44 years old now, and it's something that I have never forgotten and likely never will. I may even try to find that old farmhouse someday. Jeff, that is a really cool story, and I I see why you said that it's a pretty cool story rather than a creepy story. It's a ghost, so yeah, it's going to creep some people out, and I can understand why your dad and 
you and your brothers were a little bit creeped out at the time, but that's that's got to be your great grandfather. And my guess is the reason he showed up then, even in front of your other brothers who had never met him, I'm gonna I'm just guessing that your great grandfather was pleased to see all of the men in your family together doing something together. That's something that parents and grandparents long to see. They, they do want to see their kids, they want to see their grandkids, they want to see the extended family, but having everybody there at the same time is something that they cherish. We did that for my dad last Father's Day, uh, and it was, it was just, it was really special. I've visited my dad separately, my brother has visited uh, my dad separately, and my brother has, has a son, so that would be my dad's grandson visiting him. But it is extremely rare that we are all in the same place at the same time, and we made an effort last Father's Day to do that. And we surprised him with that, and it just meant the world to him because he had both of his boys and his grandson all there at the same time. So I'm guessing that's probably uh, why your great-grandfather showed up. Kind of, kind of his way of saying, you know what? I approve of this. But it's, it's too bad that you and your dad um, didn't get along after that and you kept uh, hanging out with him. I don't know what happened there. It's none of my business, but um, it's it's just it's sad because I know how much I love my dad and uh, he's not doing all that well. And one of these days I know, you know, he's going to be in heaven. I mean, that's just the way it is for all of us. We we all have, you know, we all have that that death sentence hanging over us no matter what time it is. But uh, it's going to be really hard when my dad passes away. And especially after after moments like that where I'm hanging out with him and my brother and, and my nephew. And uh, yeah, it's it's it, it's going to be tough. So um, if it's too bad. It's too bad you weren't able to repair things with your dad. But hopefully he's in a better place now looking down on you and is proud of who you are and what you've been doing in your life. I got that text uh, earlier and I just now looked down at it. Turns out um, Lance Reddick from uh, Fringe, if you remember that show, apparently he passed away. He was 60. Oh, man. Lance Reddick was a, a great actor. Yeah, my, my wife is inside watching the news, and so she quite often will text me while watching the news, saying, hey, this happened, this happened, this happened. She doesn't, I guess she doesn't trust me to listen to my podcast news and, uh, and get everything that's important, like, like an actor passing away, apparently. I've seen Lance Reddick in other things, not just Fringe, but that's that was like the first first thing that we saw him in. Robin and I were watching Fringe together, and he was just so great in that role. Sad day, and sixty is way too way too young to uh, to lose an actor. Okay, our next story comes from while well, she signs it. Creepy stuff happens everywhere, so we'll just call her creepy. I've been sensitive to energies, ghosts, my whole life. Every house I've ever lived in has housed spirits. For now, I'd like to talk about the house I grew up in. For the most part, everyone residing there knew that there was something strange going on in and around our house. I didn't know, however, just how many visitors knew until much later in life. To begin this ghostly journey to the past, my mom was one who didn't see, hear, or feel what the rest of us did. I was terrified for basically my whole childhood and pretty sure I never slept. As I've grown up possessing the ability to see, hear, and feel ghosts and other spirits that are present, I've gotten used to them, and they no longer terrify me, but I find them to be more intriguing. With that, let's get into the strange and unusual. Growing up, it was myself, my two older brothers, my mom, dad sometimes as he was a truck driver and gone a lot, and my grandma moved in with us when I was 12 after my grandfather passed away. My cousins would come stay with us in the summer, and a lot of our friends were there often. We lived in a two-story house, and while sitting in the living room, you could always hear footsteps upstairs. If you walked out onto the front porch, to the right was our front door, which went into the dining room. If you walked straight, there was another door, which went into our living room. We didn't use the latter, as it was blocked by the sofa in the living room, but we did hear knocking on it frequently. At first, we'd look out to see who was knocking, but after a while, we just stopped checking because there was never anyone there. And one of my brother's friends started knocking on it to startle us. I happened to go look, not expecting to see anything. Imagine my fear when someone was actually standing there. Another time, my brothers and I were telling my grandmother we noticed her, wa uh, 
telling my grandmother that we noticed her waving to us as we waited for the bus that morning. She looked confused when she told us that she wasn't even awake at that hour. I once laid in bed trying to fall asleep when I heard a knock coming from inside my closet. We did have pets, but I did not want to look in my closet, so I went downstairs instead in search of my pets and my brothers. I was hoping to find one of them missing. The brother may be playing a joke on me. They would have done something like that. Unfortunately, all was accounted for. I chose to sit on the sofa until I was too tired to keep my eyes open. My mom and dad's bedroom was at the end of the hall as you went up the stairs, and I dread when my mom sent me to her room for something. The doorknob would turn every time, just before my hand would touch it. Eventually, I ended up sleeping in this room with my grandmother because we had too many people living there and not enough bedrooms. Now and then, we would feel the bed shaking. No one believed us when we told them. My brother would frequently find his class ring in the refrigerator, and things would disappear at random. One day, we came home from school and saw someone in the upstairs window of the storage room, a room off the bedroom that my brothers shared, so we ran up the stairs to see what my parents were up to. To our surprise, there was no one home. We looked all over and all agreed that there had to be there that they had to be there somewhere. We all saw them and someone in the window. One night my mom and grandmother were at my aunt's, which was about an hour north from us. I was trying to sleep. The radio in the room was changing stations on its own, as it often did. The bed started shaking continuously, and if that wasn't enough, I saw a white figure coming from the walk-in closet. I was terrified. I couldn't even move. And then I talked to it, thinking it might actually be my grandfather checking up on Grandma. I told him that they were at my aunt's and that they'd be back soon. It didn't go away, and the bed continued to shake. Finally, I got the nerve to run down the stairs where my sister-in-law said that I looked like I'd just seen a ghost. I simply said, I just did. Jump ahead about 25 years or so. The house has been torn down. I stopped there where it used to stand on a trip to visit my mom. The yard looks smaller, and there is one plant, I don't know what it was, growing in the area where the house once stood. I walked the grounds of the yard, even checking the ditches, but it wasn't growing anywhere else, in or near the yard. I then stood in the space where the house once stood. I felt a deep sadness and loneliness. It was heartbreaking. I felt like the spirits were still there and maybe didn't know where to go. I told them they had to move on, that their dwelling had been torn down and wished them peace. A few years later, I went back to find there was nothing left. When I stood where the house once stood, I felt nothing. I hope they found peace, and more so, I hope they crossed over. I'm not much of a storyteller. I hope this isn't too hard to read. I have lots of stories from my life concerning strange things, ghosts, and even a demon. What I believe to be a demon, if you'd like to hear them. I love The Weird Darkness. It's the best podcast I've listened to so far. I hope you can use this for Fireside Frights or anything else that's fitting. Signed, Creepy Stuff Happens Everywhere. Well, obviously, it is good enough for Fireside Frights because I just shared it, so thank you very much for sending it in, Creepy. Uh, you know, I've always wondered what it's like to be a sensitive person like you who who has the, you know, the, uh, the intuitive nature. Sometimes I'm a little bit jealous of people like you, but then I don't know if I'd actually be able to handle having that with me all the time. Uh, it would be great to have it like in times of danger, like you get that spidey sense, you know, that'd be nice. But to be able to, well, like you, like you mentioned, walking where your house was and you could feel the sadness there, I don't know if I'd want to walk around the world and whenever I just happened to pass by an area that something happened, I would suddenly feel sad, you know, and then keep walking and suddenly that would go away. And then a little bit later on, I feel so, like maybe I'd feel anger or something, you know, and it would come out of nowhere because it was the, it was the environment, not me that it was, that, uh, that was, you know, conjuring it up. That would just be so that would be really difficult to grow up in especially if you're the only one if you're a kid like you mentioned you you had it as a kid um growing up and you know you were terrified for basically your whole childhood is what you said but then i guess i guess it became more refined as you grew up something along those lines and wow your house was busy not even just the spirit not just the paranormal and spiritual stuff i mean how many people did you have in that house Holy cow! You know, let's see. You got you, your two brothers, your mom, dad. Uh, sometimes your dad. 
uh, grandma. Um, so there, there's six people right there in the house already. Your cousins would come stay with you during the summer. Who knows however many of those are. And you said friends would, would come over in the house. I'm, I'm guessing you probably there, there were moments you had like 10 people living in the house. That's just... Well, of, of course you're going to hear footsteps. That, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I will say that that portion about the white entity coming out of the closet, that, it, that is creepy. That that part, as I was as I was watching this, actually kind of gave me some goosebumps. It reminds me of the scene of the white entity coming out of the out of the closet in the uh, in the original movie Poltergeist, um, and then the whole radio changing stations on its own reminds me of the static on the TV. So it's, it's almost like a scene out of Poltergeist. So anyway, thank you very much, Creepy, for sending that in. I uh, I greatly appreciate it. Okay, this next one uh, comes from Arturo. He says, Hi, Darren. I love listening to your work and have debated writing or sharing some of my stories. One challenge I faced while writing this was getting the English equivalents of certain Spanish words just right, because I knew the listeners on the other side would understand more in English than in Spanish. I hope my father's story can be featured on the podcast. This comes from South Texas, close to the border in Brownsville, Texas, but it takes place in Mexico. Well, uh, thank you for doing your best on getting this into English, because I do not speak Spanish, and <laughs> if you give me a lot of Spanish words, I'm going to be I'm going to have difficulties. Okay, so here we go. Uh, he calls this story "Tainted Water." Summer is one of those special times, and this happened to my dad when he was a boy. Visits to my dad's cousin's place in Mexico, surrounded by mesquite trees and cacti, make him forget the bright lights of Reynosa even more. Imagine a sea of stars shining down from the sky. Visibility at night was scarce. He smiled as he raised his hand and said, The only other light you could see was a bright campfire in the distance. I closed my eyes and imagined the logs as chairs, since house furniture was limited. If you had to go to the bathroom, you had to take a stroll to the outhouse. So I asked my dad what they did around these campfires and what kind of stories they told. He got a twinkle in his eye and said in Spanish, everything. But one night, I had something very strange happen to me. I moved closer to my seat because I was curious about what he meant or what he had seen. He talked about his childhood, but he didn't talk much about other paranormal things. Beyond the popular story of La Llorona, it was a bit of a taboo in our culture to talk about the supernatural because it could make you seem weird. He softly turned his head to look far away as if he were remembering something and letting out a secret. He took a deep breath and said, Okay, let me tell you about a night when something bad happened to me. It felt so real and weird at the same time. He said, That night, I went to the ranch to see my cousins. The cousins and uncles who were older than me were still having fun, so I slept in this little cabin. The floor was made of cement, and the walls were made of mesquite and adobe. There were a few layers of blankets on the bed because it was cool but not freezing. I was preparing to go to bed. I kept my eyes shut. Mom was in the same room. I kept looking at the door, and I saw that there was a barrel of water right outside the door. I swear I could see people drinking from this water, but I couldn't tell if they were my uncles or older cousins playing a trick on me. I told my mom that people were drinking the dirty water in a whisper. This water was not clean, so my mom told me to go to bed and not worry. Honestly, this made me a little scared, so I got out of bed to find out what it was. As I did, my dad said, if they want to drink that water, let them get the runs. I turned my heels around and went to bed. The next morning, I laughed as I asked who was thirsty enough to drink the stored rainwater. The cousins looked at each other and said, there was no one there. We were still telling stories around the campfire. At that moment, I got chills and weird goosebumps all over my back. I still don't know what I saw to this day. I'll let you decide what he saw that late night in the ranch, that cool summer night. Finished. Thank you, Arturo. You know, the, the stories are always so much cooler when they're told to you you know, by the person that experienced them, but when it's your own family that, that it happened to, and your dad, if if he was as articulate in Spanish as you just were in English, that would have been a great story to hear around the campfire. So definitely Fireside Frights uh, genre, uh, definitely worthy of, of what we do here. Thank you for sharing that. 
All right, let's see here. Next one comes from Eli. He says, uh, Good afternoon, Darren. I love your podcast and listen on my work commute. I believe you, I believe you and the rest of the weirdos may enjoy some of my experiences. I have several true experiences, but I heard you say not to put them into the same email, so I'll break them up. These are the first two things. I've always been what one might call open. When I was seven, my mom and I were heading back home from the store. I remember telling her that her grandmother, who was in a nursing home and pretty old, was dying and would be in heaven the next day. She didn't pay me much attention until her mother called the next day with news of my great-grandmother's passing. The second time that I remember was about five years later, when my aunt and uncle had invited all of us on a family trip to the coast for a week. I used to get a tingly feeling in my lower teeth that I'd learned to associate with a feeling. Late at night, while driving down to the vacation house, I started getting the tingling in my teeth again, so I had learned to center myself and meditate on that feeling. I don't know how I knew what I knew, but I told my mom that we should turn around and go home. I knew several of us would get sick and one would be hurt pretty bad. She told me not to worry and to go and try and get some sleep. A few days later, almost all of the adults that went out to eat without the kids got food poisoning. I stayed outside too long after the older kids locked the younger ones outside and received a third-degree sunburn on my back. My mom listened to my feelings after that trip. Thank you for letting me tell my stories. Until next time, Eli. Well, thank you, Eli. Yeah, please, send your send your stories. And sounds like all the adults there were drinking that, that, uh, that, that nasty rainwater. <laughs> uh, let's see, this next one comes from uh, Matt. He says, Hello, Darren. I found Weird Darkness about six months ago and have been binge listening ever since. I'm sending one of my many paranormal experiences I've had. Thank you for your awesome podcast and for the mental help resources that it provides. Signed, Matt. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, you, you are very welcome. I appreciate that. So let's get to your story. He says, When I was a little boy, my grandparents had a cookout one summer, and the whole family was there, along with many family friends. My granddad, grandma, mom, aunts, uncles, aunts, uncles. I keep going back and forth between aunts and aunts. Uh, I, I keep telling myself, well, if I say ants, then how are they gonna how are they gonna know that it's not the insect? But you guys are smarter than that. And and being a Kansas boy, ants is the way we always said it. <laughs> and aunts almost almost sounds like I'm trying to be too formal, uh, like I'm putting on an air. So all right, my granddad, grandma, mom, aunts, uncles, some family friends, and their children, Danny and Ronnie. Danny was the oldest of the kids and was giving me and Ronnie a ride on my granddad's four wheeler while the adults were drinking, talking, and grilling on the patio. My grandparents' house was in Chickam the Smoky Mountains region of Georgia. Chickam the Smoky Mountain? Is that is that a, is that a real place? Chickam the Smoky Mountains region? Is that the name or is it just Chickam in the Smoky Mountains region? Whatever. Anyway, um, the way the property was set up, the backyard extended about 100 feet from the back of the house, and then there was a steep hill down to a field. The field was about 80 yards long with thick woods and bamboo thickets beyond that. Danny was driving the four-wheeler and his brother in front of him and me sitting on the rack in front of the handlebars. We were flying around the backyard, down the hill, around the field, and back up again. Eventually, Danny notices the mouth of a trail at the wood's edge and asks if we want to explore the woods. It's dark and eerie, but Ronnie says yes, and not wanting to be a baby, I reluctantly agree. Danny slowly starts to drive us into the woods, and almost immediately I look up and see a single glowing red eye about 15 feet up in the dense canopy of the trees, brush, and bamboo. It's staring directly at us, and an overwhelming sense of doom fills every fiber of my being. The evil is palpable. I scream, stop! And Danny does. I turn and look at Ronnie, who has an expression of horror on his face. He sees it too, and begins to beg his brother to turn around. We're both crying at this point. Danny has no idea what's going on. He keeps asking, what? What's wrong? Ronnie and I both point to the eye. In an instant, Danny does a donut and we are flying full throttle toward the house, topping the hill so fast we become airborne. All of us keep looking back, expecting a monster, a demon, the devil himself, something to be chasing us. We make it to the backyard, screaming, crying, terrified. The adults all come running toward us. What's wrong? Are you okay? What's wrong? 
The three of us exclaim frantically over each other, the eye, the red eye, a monster, the devil. When we finally calm down enough to verbalize what we had seen, my uncle walks to his truck and comes back with a rifle. Show me. We walk toward the edge of the hill. Danny, Ronnie, and I can all still see it, the eye still watching us from the edge of the woods in the distance. We point it out, but my uncle can't see it. It's not long before the rest of the adults walk over to meet us, and we point the eye out to all of them, but none of them see it either. My granddad and uncle go to investigate. Danny, Ronnie, and I wait and watch from the safety of the backyard as my granddad and uncle walk, each with rifle in hand, all the way down the hill, across the field, to the wood's edge, to the mouth of the trail. The red eye is directly above them. They turn back and look at us as if, as if to ask if they're in the right spot. We nod and point. They look all around and eventually return saying, there's nothing there you're imagining things. In her best effort to comfort the three of us, my grandma tells us maybe it was just a cardinal or a piece of trash stuck in the branches. All the while, we still see the evil red eye, still filled with a sense of dread and doom. I don't recall the rest of the evening. I never saw the red eye again. I also never went into that field again, and certainly not the wood's edge. My grandparents eventually sold that house and moved to a larger property. I'm 42 years old now and still know without a doubt the red eye was very much real and very much evil. I'm thankful whatever it was, it was unable to get us that day. Holy cow. Okay, um, uh, when when you were telling the story, at first, Matt, I, I thought maybe you and your friends were seeing a radio tower. Uh, now, the radio towers, the, they can have a single red light if they're, a, if they're a, a shorter radio tower. I know this from being in radio for so, for so long. Um, sometimes they can just have like a single light towards the top, uh, but they're supposed to be flashing. So if your red eye was flashing, then that's what I would have guessed it was. But I'm guessing that it wasn't flashing. But when you get to the point where the adults come in and they're looking right at the same place you are, they're not seeing anything, but you're still seeing the red eye? Okay, well then the whole radio transmitter, uh, radio antenna thing is out the window. So I have no idea what that was. Because you're right, the adults should have been able to see it. It's not like certain sounds where only younger people can hear them and, and you get past those sounds as you get older because your ears start to go bad. They actually have ringtones for like teenagers that only the teenagers can hear. But your eyes don't work the same way as that, uh, especially not all the adults at the same time. I can understand one of them maybe getting glaucoma and not being able to see, but then they wouldn't be out there with a rifle either. That is some creepy stuff, Matt. Um, I'm very curious as to what you experienced as well. And you mentioned that cert that feeling of evil, and while I was still thinking of the radio tower, I was thinking, okay, well, that's just your imagination scaring you, and that's why you had that feeling of evil. But once you got past that and got, into the, got the adults in there, that feeling of evil, okay, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. Um, man, if you ever do find out what that is, please let me know. Or if somebody knows what that might be. If you know of some sort of creature, entity, whatever, that has, that has a single red eye and can only be seen by the younger crowd, uh, I'd be interested in knowing what this thing is. Thanks again, Matt. This next one is sent from uh, Darren. Well, hey, Darren. It's Darren. How you doing? Okay. He says, my family has a story about my great-grandmother when she was close to passing away. When my parents heard this, they went to go visit and say their goodbyes. At this point, however, my great-grandmother, M for short, was kind of out of it. So when my parents left my aunt went in, uh, so when my parents left, my aunt went in after them to say goodbye as well. When my aunt went to talk to M, M thought my aunt was my mother, E for short. Then basically, my great-grandmother said E was going to have another baby, and the baby was going to be a blonde girl. Fast forward some months later, my aunt tells E what my great-grandmother said, turns out R was pregnant with my little blonde-haired sister. I typed this on my phone, not sure if it's something for Fireside Frights, but I love the podcast, listen to it all day at work. Well, th thank you, Darren, I appreciate it. Not one of the creepier stories, but still interesting and entertaining. And, uh, boy, I mean, de bedside, uh, what do you call that, uh, death deathbed confessions are one thing, 
deathbed uh, predictions are something completely different. And apparently your great grandmother nailed it. Okay, this next one uh, looks like they want to remain anonymous. So that's what I'll call them. Okay, hello, Darren. I emailed you before to say thank you for all you do and shared with you a photo I took of a supposed Sasquatch track. I thought I'd take the time to share that full story with you. Should you choose to use this story, I only ask you ex exclude my name. Not that this story isn't true. Rather, I'd simply just be I'd like to be left anonymous if at all possible. I hope you understand. Now for the meat of the story. Before I get into the story, I am really sorry. I don't know what I did with that photo that Anonymous sent to me. Uh, he sent me the photo and I looked at it and it definitely does look like a real Bigfoot track and not one of those that's in the dirt and it's very, very obvious. It's just the way, it's the way that the, the, uh, the ground cover was, was padded down and you could see the toes in it. It, it definitely, definitely looked like an actual Bigfoot, um, B Bigfoot photo. That's, uh, gosh, I wish I still had that. If I can find it, I'll post it up there uh, on the website at WeirdDarkness.com in the Weird News section in the blog, but uh, I, I, just, I can't find it right now. Now, now I'm kicking myself for it, but I'll, I'll tell you the story anyway. He says, You might notice I state the photo to be a supposed Sasquatch track. There is a reason for this. Nova Scotia, Canada is not the first place one would think of when they hear of Sasquatch. It seems rather off the general beaten path of other better-known encounter accounts. Uh, better known encounter accounts. Though it isn't that far from other supposed hotspots, such as the woods of Maine or New Brunswick, for that matter. Both these areas have a number of reports. Nova Scotia itself is also no stranger to the weird and dark tales. Do you see what I did there? Supposed photos of Sasquatch were taken not far from, from Bridgewater in Nova Scotia and even appeared on the television show Paranormal Caught on Camera. Thus, why would I class my photo or experience as supposed? Well, to be honest, in st it stems from some of the happenings involved, which I will now explain. The photo was taken in the fall of 2021, late October, early November. I am an avid, though not successful, deer hunter. I've hunted 11 years and never bagged a deer. Shot squirrels, rabbits, ducks, coyotes, trapped raccoons, and made a hat. Though deer, I have not been of the greatest luck. I've been living in the southern part of Nova Scotia since December of 2014, having moved there for my work. I was a pastor for a small community church in the area. One of the local families told me a sort of boggy clearing I should check out and I should have some luck in bagging a deer that year, 2021. I was excited and cleared a day and time to go into the woods and reach the spot. I don't own an ATV, so my travels would be on foot. Given the area I'd be traveling, I opted to take my Moserberg 512 gauge. I had with me slugs, buckshot, and loads for small game. I followed the only the old train track, now uh, now a trail, behind where I lived to where several worn deer trails branch off. I snaked my way down a few following the directions I had and making note, and there was a considerable deer sign in that area. Large numbers of tracks and even some scat gave me hopes that this might well be my year. I continued down the trail following some fresher signs and took an off route. This was not a smooth trail. The ground was rocky and broken, thick with mud and moss and a few little creeks. Something many don't think of in regards to my home province. Nova Scotia is a lot of rocky swampland along the coasts, and I love it. Though back to the story. I followed the trail and came to a fork. Left followed a stream, no space to walk on the sides, and too deep to walk down in, I checked. To the right and in front of me was a trail that went up. It looked like something pulled out or washed out part of it, so there was about a four-foot climb, a cliff to climb. I unloaded my shotgun, broke it down, and placed it in my backpack. I began to climb and, once on stable ground, I reassembled my shotgun and loaded in three deer slugs. Before continuing the trail, I gave a few calls out with a grunt collar. I figured I might get lucky. Nothing. Then I heard a soft whoop. Thought that's odd. So I continued on. The ground got more and more soupy, and I walked on the thick moss where I was able. As I went, I could hear something up ahead moving. I heard sticks breaking. I stopped and ducked down. I gave another call on my grunt collar and leveled my shotgun on the clearing ahead. 
I figured it was 50 yards and knew that I was comfortable taking a shot with my shotgun at that range if the deer, buck, or doe crossed that trail or came into that clearing. I was certain I could hit it and would finally have my first deer. I waited and could hear the sound of sticks breaking. Then it stopped. Everything stopped. There was not a sound. No birds, no bugs, no squirrels. It was dead still. After a while, I heard something walking away and figured I should keep going. As I continued to walk down the trail, about 15 minutes from where I stopped, it came to another fork. I knelt to check which direction to go when I noticed a footprint in the soft ground. Now, I've been around bears. I've seen bear tracks. I've been given a false or bluff charge by a black bear. This was not a bear's track. For one thing, there were no claws, as you saw, Darren. Also, there was no front footprint anywhere. The track looked human-like. Though in Nova Scotia, in the wet, cold ground, no one's walking around barefoot. It was not an easy walk to get here. In several places, I found myself getting sucked down into the mud or having to carefully wade through shallow pools. I checked for other tracks and found six total, all going down the left fork. I snapped a photo with a two and three quarter shotgun shell for scale. I even pressed my foot into the ground for comparison. I'm five foot nine, 185 to 190 pounds. My foot barely left the mark, and my boots, you can tell it's a boot print. This track had toes, clear toes. I was stunned. I made a quick video and sent it to my wife, or tried to. In it, I said something like, I may not be able to find deer, but I think I just found Sasquatch. My wife teases me about my interest in Bigfoot. I was excited and started down the left trail. I was only about 10 or 15 yards and I heard a sort of group sound, as if something was saying, hey, I know you're following me now, stop. Oh, I kept going. It was maybe 10 more yards down the trail. I have goosebumps as I write this. When I heard a louder group, I decided it was time to leave. I headed back down the trail and the whole way I could not help but feel like I was being followed. It wasn't until I reached the old train tracks that it stopped and my video made it to my wife. Now This is where I state where I say supposed Sasquatch print. A few weeks later, after I had some rather rough news concerning my job, I went out hunting again to clear my head and spend some time with God. The woods have always felt like a place that I could connect with God, be it fishing, hunting, trapping, or just walking. My grandfather was the same way. As I sat in my makeshift blind watching over a game trail that comes out into a clearing, I heard my middle daughter's voice clear as a bell. It said, Daddy, help, I'm lost. Daddy, come help me, I need you. I could hear her, though it didn't sound exactly like her. It didn't sound as panicked as my daughter would be. It was coming from the clearing next to me. I tried to look into the clearing, but couldn't see anything. I again heard my daughter's voice. This time she said, Daddy, help, they're after me, I need you. I jumped up and came tearing through the brush with my shotgun in hand. There was no one in the clearing, though there in the center was my daughter's Rainbow Dash winter hat, a hat she lost about a week before when it disappeared off of our back deck. I picked up the hat and heard a creepy laugh from the woods. It was like something was trying to mimic a child's laugh but was too large. I at once started to pray. I got my pack from my blind and left the area. When I got home, I asked my wife if our kids had gone into the woods to play. She said no and asked why. I showed her the hat, and my middle daughter said excitedly, it's my missing hat, you got it back. Not you found it, she said you got it back. Later I told my wife what happened and she and I prayed for our family. I didn't hunt there anymore after that. Never did get my deer. I also don't live in the area. I hope you enjoyed the encounter. Thanks for listening. Wow, Anonymous. Um, yeah, you did not send me that story when you first sent me the photo. Uh, but okay, now, yeah, it was it a Sasquatch? It looks like a Sasquatch track. I can understand why you would think it was that at the beginning. I have never heard of Sasquatch sightings, though, where they mimic human voices to the point of actually saying words and sentences that make sense. I've heard of the whoop sound. You know, they have a really weird call, uh, according to some people. Just look up Bigfoot Yowl or Bigfoot 
uh, scream on YouTube and, and you'll hear what I'm talking about. But I don't, th I don't think I've ever heard of one that's pretending to be a child or a person in order to lure somebody in. That, that is creepy, man. So I do have one question for you, though, a little bit off topic. You went into this place, you don't have an ATV, you're going so deep into the woods to all of these different places, going through muck and mire, through swamp area. If you did get a deer, how on earth were you supposed to get that out of there? Were you just going to shoot it and leave it? I don't think so. You're, you don't strike me as that kind of guy. So I've, I've, You had to have some sort of plan, but man, I, I could not do that physically. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, Anonymous, for sending that in. I appreciate it. All right, this one comes from Robbie. He says, Hey, Darren, been listening to the podcast since the pandemic. I have multiple stories I want to share from both my childhood as well as a story from my mom, but for this one, I'll focus on something that happened in my childhood. When I was about eight years old, I lived in a three-bedroom house that gave me creeps every once in a while. I say every once in a while because I lived there nine years but had only a few experiences. My room was in the back of the house next to my parents' room, and the third bedroom was in the front, which we used as a media room. One night when I was grounded, which happened more times than I can count, I was laying in my room late at night trying to go to sleep. My room was pitch black, and at the time I slept with the door open. That night both my parents were watching TV in the front bedroom, and I don't remember why, but I looked out my door into the dark hallway. As I'm doing so, I notice a tall, dark shape in the doorway of my parents' bedroom. It didn't move, but I remember, I swear, it looked like it was wearing a rimmed hat, kind of like an Old West outlaw shape hat. Frightened, I rose up from my bed, about to call my parents, and at that exact same time, I felt something grab the back of my collar and yank me back down to the bed, like it wanted me to lay down and stay there. I was so freaked out, I didn't move for the next hour or so, until I saw both my parents go into their room for the night. Gradually, I ended up falling asleep. I have more stories about this house, but I'll save those for another time. Love the podcast. Keep up the great work. It gets me through my work days. Signed, Robbie. Robbie, thank you very much for those kind words. I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, your story ends in a way that so many other stories end, and I just don't understand it. How can you have an incident like this and still somehow find a way to get back to sleep. I, I, I've never understood that. But it happens. It happened to me as well when I had my demonic experience of the sleep paralysis. I was somehow able to get back to sleep. I just don't understand how the body and the human brain can, can make that happen. You would think you'd be in that fight or flight mode and that your, your uh, adrenaline would be pumping to the point that you'd have to get up and walk around, do something in order to try and and wear yourself out and get get rid of the energy before you could go back to sleep. But so many people will just say, no, I stayed there in bed and eventually fell back to sleep. So weird. So, so weird. Uh, okay, and uh, we got one last one. This one comes from Renee. She says, Darren, attached is a copy of my personal story about how my best friend and I had the unfortunate experience of coming face to face with evil. I hope you can find a place in your podcast to read it. Please let me know if you need any more information about it. Feel free to edit as you wish if necessary. Thanks for reviewing my story, and if you like it, I have many more personal experiences in my past that I can share, most of which are paranormal in nature. I hope you enjoy it. Well, before I even get to your story, Renee, yes, please send me the other stories. As to me editing it as I wish, I don't do that with Fireside Frights. I read them exactly the way I get them because I don't read them in advance. Um, I could do that and try to be more professional, <laughs> but Fireside Frights is one of those times where I kind of like, I just kind of relax and just kind of let it flow. Uh, it, it, I think it kind of helps with the whole intimacy thing about it. But anyway, uh, Renee, uh, she calls this the mummy man. Well, right then and there, that's going to be a great, that's a great title for a story regardless. All right. She says, I grew up in a small town named Quincy, Illinois which is located on the bump on the southwestern part of the state, alongside the Mississippi River, not far from Hannibal, Missouri, the hometown of one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. Quincy was voted as an all-American city in 1962 and 1985. It's a place where most people feel safe. Doors are rarely locked. Most of the people living in and around Quincy are hard-working, honest folk. We lived outside of town on a single, residential country road. 
so far from the actual town that my bus ride to school was a two-hour ride in. Holy cow, Renee! Two hours to get to school from the bus stop. That is a, you got to get up early. All right. Anyway, we were surrounded by dairy farms and cornfields. You'd think that a place like this wouldn't be an area that was plagued with violent crimes, and for the most part, you'd be right. However, during the early 1980s, several communities in and around the Quincy area were in a state of panic. There was a serial rapist slash murderer whom the press had nicknamed the Mummy Man. He used gauze to conceal his identity. This person was targeting vulnerable young girls, raping them, and he'd murdered at least one person as well. He was getting bolder as time passed, terrorizing the people who were living in the area. Some say he was arrested and sent to jail during the spring of 1982. However, the man in police custody whom they believed to be the infamous rapist didn't use any gauze or try to conceal his identity in any way. He was, however, someone who was guilty of sexually assaulting two other women, so it was good they caught him. Many of the locals who lived in the area in the 1980s don't believe that they had captured the mummy man. Some believe he may still be out there, somewhere. In 1981 and 1982, my friends and I were all around 12 to 13 years old, which wasn't much younger than the girls being raped by this horrible person. We all kept up with the news about the mummy man. Although none of us believed that we were in real danger. I mean, it was just a story about stuff happening to other people, right? When you're that age, you seldom believe that anything bad would ever happen to you or anyone you know in real life. Unfortunately, two of us were about to find out that we should have been more cautious than we were, because our arrogance was to be proven dead wrong and our lives would never be the same again. It was the beginning of November, back in 1982, right after Halloween. The weather was turning colder, with icy rain and snowstorms hitting us almost every night. Quite appropriate for the spooky time of year, many of us thought. Michael Jackson's newest album, Thriller, was to be released soon, and I intended to be one of the first kids in my circle of friends to get a copy. I've always been a huge fan of MJ. The week before the album was available, I'd asked my parents if it was okay for my best friend, I'll call her Becky, to sleep over at our house that night so we could listen to the new album together. To my surprise, not only did they say yes, but they were going to allow us to use our family RV all night. Growing up, my parents loved taking us on camping trips. We bought our first motorhome in 1979 and went camping as often as possible, especially when my parents had a long weekend or some vacation time. While at home, the family RV was parked on the side of our garage, which was attached to the house on the other side. Nobody could hear us if we wanted to listen to our music loud. Dad even hooked up the water and electric for my sleepover so we could use the big speakers, the TV, and even the bathroom. My mom even stocked the shelves with chips and cookies, and she loaded up the fridge with pop as well. It was going to be like having our own private place to eat junk food and rock out all night long. Becky and I had planned on listening to and learning all the lyrics as well of every song on the album before going back to school on Monday. That'd make us look pretty cool, in our own minds anyway. Becky and I looked forward to our special sleepover all week and could hardly wait to get into the camper for the night. At 9 p.m., we had just finished eating some pizza, so we changed into our pajamas and got ready to crank up the music, dance, laugh, and just have fun. At around 9.30, Becky and I were in the middle of dancing and being silly when suddenly she just stopped dancing, almost as if she were frozen in place and was staring at the front windshield. I was pretty confused at first and was about to ask her what was wrong when she quietly whispered, Oh my God, Renee, don't move, just look. She slightly gestured for me to look out the front windshield of the motorhome. What we saw makes me break into chills to this day. I'll never forget it, neither will she. Looking outside, just across the street from my house and standing directly underneath the streetlight, we saw a large man in a trench coat. His body was facing the motorhome, as if he were staring directly at us. We'd been dancing to loud music with the lights on, so there's no way that this person didn't notice us. What really freaked us out, however, was the fact that his entire face, head, hands, were completely wrapped with gauze. It was like being in a horror movie, seeing the killer for the first time as he was planning on what to do to us. For what seemed like hours, we were frozen in place, just staring at this scary man 
who wasn't even moving, just staring back at us. The only time we saw him move was to light a cigarette, and then he'd just slowly smoke it. I whispered to Becky, how are we going to let my mom and dad know what's happening outside? We're too far away from the house to make a run for the front or even the back door, and I don't think we'd make it without him catching us anyway. Keep in mind, this was 1982. We didn't have a cell phone to contact my parents inside who were sleeping inside, and we knew that nobody would be able to hear us if we decided to scream, since the motorhome was parked next to our garage, which had a brick wall, and our neighbors were definitely too far away to hear us. He had seen us, and we were trapped. After I said that, Betty panicked and just reached out and grabbed the curtain from behind the driver's seat of our motorhome. She then quickly pulled it shut. I just looked at her and said, well, that's not going to do us any good. Now he knows that we saw him. Why'd you do that? After whisper arguing back and forth, trying to come up with any ideas as to how we could beat him and get into the house, we realized we were sitting ducks. So we simply cried, holding on to each other while trying to stay awake. We were about to become the next victims of the mummy man. There was no doubt in our minds that the serial murderer and rapist was the same guy who was now across the street from my house. The one night two of us were determined to stay awake all night, planning on fighting him off if he tried to get in. We ended up falling asleep sometime during the wee hours of the morning and were surprised to find out we were still in one piece and undisturbed. As the sun began to shine through some of the windows in the RV, Becky and I began to feel brave enough to look outside. Ever so slowly, we pulled back the curtain in the front of the camper and peered across the street. He was gone. When we slowly opened the door, we found ourselves speechless. Looking down around the motorhome, we noticed that there were fresh, muddy footprints all around the vehicle, as if someone walked around the RV several times, possibly trying to peek in and see if we were still there, or simply to scare us. If that was his intent, mission accomplished. Becky and I immediately ran into my house to tell my parents about what we experienced. My dad called the police, and we were able to give them a statement. So that's how my best friend and I encountered one of the most dangerous criminals in our hometown. Whew. Wow, Renee. I am so sorry that that happened to you. I'm glad I'm glad nothing physical happened to you, but yeah, that's going to be that's going to emotionally scar a person for the rest of their lives. Um I'd never heard of the mummy man uh before. I'm going to have to look into that. But you were saying that I, apparently he's never been caught and I I appreciate it. Uh, Renee was kind enough to send me some some links for reference to to this guy. So I might do a story about him in the future. Renee, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to you sending other stories because you, you got some great writing skills there. Well, everybody, that's it. That's my last story. Um, if you want to send a story for a future Fireside Frights, I would love to get it. Just go to WeirdDarkness.com, click on Tell Your Story, and you can send in your Fireside Fright there. I try to use all of the ones that I've received over the month and uh, this one goes through, uh, yeah, now uh, I, had, I had these back from February 16th all the way up through to today. So once I use all of these, I am now down to zero stories. So if you want to Fireside Frights next month, you need to send me some stories. Again, just go to WeirdDarkness.com and then click on Tell Your Story. Thank you for listening, everybody. If you like what the show, whether it be the Fireside Frights or just the regular Weird Darkness, please share the show with everybody that you know. People who like the paranormal stories, monsters, unsolved mysteries, true crime, stuff like that. Um, WeirdDarkness.com, that's also where you can find me on all of my social media. I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, uh, MeWe, Minds, uh, uh, YouTube. Um, you can also find um, audiobooks that I've narrated, including some free ones if you want to listen to those. You can, uh, you've got the Weird Darkness store if you want to grab a, a Weird Darkness t-shirt, hoodie, mug, whatever. Um, all that other fun stuff. I got monthly contests that I do there. And of course, you can tell me your creepy stories. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions, copyright 2023. Now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
And a final thought from C.S. Lewis. Put first things first, and second things are thrown in. Put second things first, and you lose both first and second things. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.